Well, thank you, Mrs. Bowler, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was pretty depressing listening to those previous speakers. In fact, I'm amazed that I see smiles on anyone's faces. It is, yes, very depressing story. America is in serious trouble, and I'm going to be talking today about how we got that way, and then at the very end, what we can do about it. So let's get on with the real story. I think the good place to begin is by telling you a little apocryphal story about uh, show and tell day in the uh, first grade in school. Uh, the teacher had told the children to bring something to class that was interesting and new so they could stand up and show it to the class and tell them all about it. So they all did, most of them brought toys, but uh, little Johnny brought a kitten. Well, naturally, the kitten was more interesting in the long run than most of the toys, so it didn't take long before the whole class was focused on the kitten. And the question came up, was this a boy kitten or a girl kitten? Well, there was a heated discussion on this. Everybody had an opinion, but nobody really knew how to answer the question. So it was just opinions, 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 until finally the teacher asked the class, uh, does anybody know how you can tell the difference between a boy kitten and a girl kitten? And uh, silence fell across the classroom. No one had a clue. And finally Johnny raised his hand. He says, I know. The teacher got very concerned with that one and she asked cautiously, says, well, Johnny, how can you tell? Tell the class. He said, well, my dad says we live in a democracy. And so, in a democracy, you vote on everything, so let's vote on this issue and we'll find out the truth. <laughs> so you know right away this was an American school because it's true, isn't it, that uh, all of us, certainly myself included, have been taught from a very early age that we live in a democracy. It's one of those words that we need to get very serious about defining, but we get this general impression that democracy means a majority rule and that's wonderful. So the majority should decide everything. And the more serious the issue, then the more need there is to have the majority uh, you know, express its view. Well, the purpose of my presentation is a little bit upstream. I'm going to be saying, basically, that this, although it's a cherished American concept, it's a very dangerous one. If you don't think it through and don't put limitations on it, it's a very dangerous concept. And as a matter of fact, it is the concept that is being used against the American people and people all over the world to their own detriment, to put them, in fact, into a condition of bondage, a condition in which they elect their own dictators and feel happy about it because they did it to themselves. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Now, as you probably know, the title of this presentation is called The Quigley Formula. So let's take a look at that. What is this thing, The Quigley Formula? And the first step is to answer the question, who is this man, Quigley? Now, I say this man, Quigley, because the name is Carol Quigley, and sometimes people think that's a woman. Well, it's not. It's Carol Quigley that we're talking about, who was, he's deceased now, but he was a very well-known professor of history who taught at Georgetown University. And while he was there, he had a very famous student by the name of William Clinton. And Clinton studied under Quigley and became a favored student and spent some personal time with him and admired Quigley. Twenty-seven years later, when this student was given the nomination for President of the United States, in his acceptance speech, he mentioned Professor Carol Quigley in his speech and paid homage to him. After he was elected President of the United States, he made at least two public appearances of which I'm aware, where again, he mentioned Professor Carol Quigley and thanked him for the influence 
that this man had had on the political awareness and thinking of himself, President Clinton. So there was no question about it that, that Quigley was Clinton's mentor. Now why is this significant? It's significant because Professor Quigley taught the conspiratorial view of history as explained by the conspirators themselves. Quigley was very close to a secret society. In fact, he had been invited, he said in his own works, he had been invited into its inner circle and given the privilege of examining the society's private papers. He was considered to be the official historian of this secret society and he admired it. He thought it was wonderful. He felt privileged to be close to it and to its documents. And he wrote a couple of books about this, as a matter of fact. And he said the only point of disagreement that he had with this secret organization was that it wished to remain hidden from view. He felt that by now, with all these years of success and movement, it was time to come forward and to boast about what it had accomplished and to proclaim openly what its goals were. So Quigley was the historian of a secret society. Now that means therefore that when President Clinton gave homage to Professor Quigley, his comments had two meanings. To the average person who did not know who Quigley was or what position he held or what he had written about, they thought, oh, well, isn't that nice? Here's uh, Bill Clinton giving homage to some nice old professor that had an influence on his collegiate days. How nice. But to those who knew, to those who knew who Quigley was and what his position was and what he wrote about and what he advocated, and we'll be talking a lot about that today, then they understood there was another message, a hidden message. Clinton was saying he knew about this conspiracy and he was now in its service. That was a signal to everyone around the world who understood what the real meaning was. They knew that Clinton now was in the service of this secret society that we'll be talking about today. Now, I've mentioned the word conspiracy before. I'll probably be using it again several times today. And that causes some concern for a lot of people because it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction for people to say, oh, you believe in conspiracy? What are you, a, a conspiracy theorist of some kind? Well, I'm certainly not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, when people take that position, I have to laugh because I feel sorry for them. They've obviously never read a history book. Because anyone who knows anything about history knows that it's built on conspiracies from one end to the other. Conspiracy is the engine of history. Every major event in history, when you examine it, has come to pass largely as a result of at least one, and in many cases, many conspiracies. And it goes on today. These people have never sat in a courtroom and listened to lawyers try men and corporations on the charge of conspiracies. Conspiracies in corporations, conspiracies in families, conspiracies from top to bottom. Conspiracies are a fact of life. And for anybody to say that conspiracies are uh, absurd and that anyone who thinks that conspiracies are real is a conspiracy theorist has a real problem. I do not have this problem. I know the conspiracies are real, and we'll be talking about a very real conspiracy today, and we'll document it with the words of the people themselves who are involved in it, and they're very proud of it. So, but let's not drop the word with that. What is a conspiracy? The dictionary defines conspiracies generally as having three components. If you have three, these three components, then you're dealing with a conspiracy. First, it has to involve two or more people. 
Secondly, it has to use tactics that are either uh, immoral or at least coercion. And thirdly, the objective of these tactics has to be illegal or immoral. All right, that's generally the definition of a conspiracy. So let's take a look before we get into the details of the conspiracy we'll be talking about today and just look at the surface. First of all, will there be two or more people involved? And you bet there are many people involved. Certainly not the masses, but a lot more than two. So we can check that one off. The second part is, do they use deception or coercion? And yes, indeed, they boast about it, as a matter of fact, saying that the masses are so stupid that you have to fool them for their own good. And you have to pass laws to use coercion in order to force people to do what they want. So yes, you can check that one off. They do use deception and coercion. But now we come to the third issue. Is the objective illegal or immoral? Well, it's certainly not illegal in most cases because we'll find out in a moment, as you folks already know, these are the people that make the laws. So what they're doing is entirely legal because they made it legal. They hold the powers of political power, legislative power, executive power, judicial power. And so what they're doing is not illegal. If they're going to merge, let's say, merge the United States or let's say get rid of the United States and merge what is left of it with Mexico and Canada in a North American Union, for example, just one of many things we could talk about, it will be done entirely legally. It will be done with no objection from Congress. The courts will uphold it. And they'll figure out all kinds of ways to, to justify it as a legal move. So it's not illegal in most cases, although sometimes they do resort to illegal measures, but that's very rare. That leaves finally the last issue. Is it immoral or unethical? Now in the minds of these people, it is the highest morality. They think that their goal is the highest morality possible. They are working towards what they fondly call the New World Order. In their minds, that is the ultimate morality. And it's people like you and me who are the immoral ones, the idiots that think that national sovereignty has some kind of value in this modern world. We are the ones standing in the way of progress, we are the ones standing in the way of the happiness of mankind. We are the ones that are for, for all kinds of uh, injustice. We are the ones that are immoral, you see. So in their minds, they're very moral in everything they do. And the end justifies the means. If they have to sacrifice individuals or minorities or large numbers of people to achieve this wonderful goal, it's an act of honor. It's an act of high ethics. So in their mind, they are not conspirators because we fail to have all three of these elements. They are not conspirators in their mind. But now in the minds of the rest of us who have to live in this order that they are forcing upon us through coercion and deception, I think we have every reason to consider that the objective is unethical and is immoral and is disastrous to the American people and to people everywhere in the world. So I think for us to use the word conspiracy is entirely justified. Now having gotten that out of the way, let's get down to the substance of what this conspiracy really is. Professor Quigley described this conspiracy in two books. One is called Tragedy and Hope, and the other is The Anglo-American Establishment. Tragedy and Hope in particular is a very thick book. They're both history books. They're written by a history professor. They're both pretty dry. They're hard to read. You get a lot of dull, factual information, names, dates, places, events, and so forth, and it's easy to go to sleep reading these books. But then all of a sudden, you'll come across a paragraph or a sentence that'll just blow your socks off. And you'll go back and say, did he really say that? And indeed he did. Remember, he's the historian of this group. These books were not written for mass consumption. They were written primarily for academia and for people who were involved.